people, politics, and prose, FPRIs, conversations with authors about their works, their careers, and the ideas that drive them. I'm Ron Granary, director of FPRI's Center for the Study of America and the West, and a Templeton Education Fellow at FPRI. I'm also a professor of history at the U.S. Army War College, and so would like to add that any comments that I make are my own and not those of the U.S. Army uh, or the Department of Defense. But with all that is merely introduction to say how delighted we are that you could join us here today. All of us at FPRI are happy that you can be here on live on Zoom and recorded on the FPRI YouTube page. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Today's world is unthinkable without the machines that do so much thinking for us. We would not be recording this conversation right now without the newest technology. And that technology is built on a foundation of tiny circuits on wafers of silicon. How those chips came to be, where they are made, and how they have and will continue to influence geopolitics are the subject of a new book, Chip War, The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology, by Professor Chris Miller. In a sweeping historical narrative that takes us from the laboratories of American universities to the South China Sea, from the immediate post-war era to the day after tomorrow, Miller explains how Silicon Valley got its name and how those silicon chips have become essential to ongoing high-stakes gambling about the future of the world. Identifying key personalities and institutions, Miller helps us to understand who brought us to where we are and who will be the key actors in the future of this conflict. So how did the fate of humanity become tied to wafers of silicon? How will the struggle to produce and supply those wafers shape the geopolitics of the future and the future of geopolitics? Who will win the chip war? These are some of the questions we will address today in our conversation with Professor Chris Miller. Chris Miller is the director of FPRI's Eurasia program. He is also assistant professor of international history at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University with a BA from Harvard and a PhD from Yale. In addition to Chip War, his books include We Shall Be Masters, Russian Pivots to East Asia from Peter the Great to Putin, which was featured on this very program just last year, as well as Putinomics, Power and Money in Resurgent Russia, and The Struggle to Save the Soviet Economy, Mikhail Gorbachev, and the Collapse of the USSR. He is a regular contributor to publications such as Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, and the Wall Street Journal. He is... I can say, one of the brightest young stars in the current academic firmament, especially when it comes to talking about Eurasia. Uh, and we are delighted that he is part of the FPRI family and that we have him on the program today. Welcome to People, Politics, and Prose again, Chris Miller. Well, thank you so much for having me, Ron. So Chris, um, how did you end up writing a book about silicon chips after writing about the Soviet economy and Russian foreign policy? Well, I, I actually began this book almost five years ago, planning to write a history of the missile race during the Cold War, mm. um, which I thought was uh, an interesting story because the results of the missile race were in some ways counterintuitive. We, we know that the U.S. and the Soviet Union both had extraordinary capacity to build nuclear weapons, and both countries built lots of nuclear weapons with, with massive explosive power. Uh, we know that both countries built space programs. The Soviets were actually ahead of the U.S. in terms of getting the first satellite and the first human, uh, also the first dog into space. Um, but the Soviets lagged behind in terms of their ability to send missiles uh, exactly to target. And this gap increased as the, the course of the Cold War went on. And, and this, to me, presented a bit of a puzzle. Why was it they could do certain technological things but failed abjectly at other technological tasks, especially when, if you think about guiding missiles to target, that's a really important military application. You'd think they would have invested a lot of resources into it, and it turns in they had. And so I began digging into uh, the challenge of missile guidance in the, in the early to mid-Cold War, uh, when both countries were pouring uh, huge sums of money and directing many of their best scientists to the task of guiding missiles more accurately to the target. And what I found was that miniaturizing computing power, uh, which is what you need to put a guidance computer in nose of a missile uh, was one of the greatest scientific and engineering challenges uh, of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And it was only possible to do uh, with the invention of something called the computer chip, which I had 
been aware of. I hadn't really thought very much about. <laughs> I knew they were inside my computer, but beyond that, I I'd really uh, uh, had very little knowledge about chips. Um, and it was only when I I came to learn that they uh, first emerged out of the Cold War arms race that I began to realize that there's actually an interesting story here, not just about computers or technology, but about geopolitics as well. Right. Well, and and that I think is is fascinating in the way that you tell the story. Right. You you tell both the you know, how the chips come to be and how people end up using them. And one learns an awful lot of things in the way I, back when, back when I was teaching uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, I taught a lecture uh, course in, I guess it was Moore Hall. I don't know if it's the same name for the same Moore, but in the lobby was a big chunk, not the entire chunk, but a big chunk of the old ENIAC, the original uh, computer, uh, which takes up an awful lot of space and has all those vacuum tubes in it. And um, I learned for the first time actually reading your book, uh, first of all, that vacuum tubes like light bulbs tend to overheat, so they have to be replaced because they burn out, and that they attract moths, and that uh, debugging a computer actually originally meant going in and getting rid of all the moths that were attracted to the heat of the vacuum tubes. And so uh, the idea of making this shift from the vacuum tube to the transistor, and then to add all of the circuits to those transistors, is part of the story that you tell. And uh, it starts in the U.S., and so I, um, I'm curious uh, there, but it doesn't stop there, of course, and it spreads. And so um, what were the conditions that allowed for the creation of the silicon chip in the U.S. to start? Well, as you said, the, the first computers um, that were based on vacuum tubes uh, were pioneered largely in the U.S. and the U.K., the centers mm -hmm. of computing technology. And World War II caused a lot of resources to be put into computers for things like code breaking, um, which at the time was a, a key use case uh, for computers. And when World War II ended, uh, both the US and UK militaries had a fair number of computers, which at the time was a, a room um, that had, um, that had uh, several tens of thousands of switch light bulbs that turned on and off, vacuum tubes that turned on and off. Um, and there were uh, the realization that there would be growing uses for these if they could be made reliable and cost-effective. Um, because over the, the early decades of the 20th century, before World War II, uh, organizations had grown larger, whether it's corporations or the government, and had more data to deal with. Uh, and they wanted more effective means of calculating things with that data. And so if you rewind the clock a bit before that, in the 1920s and 30s, computer was a profession. You could mm -hmm. be a computer. I was a human. Right. Uh, who you'd have to pay and give a lunch break to, and they'd sit in an office and take up space. Um, but that was necessary because there was lots of data to deal with. And, and the amount of data that uh, that large organizations, especially the government, wanted to deal with was growing. Um, and as the military began to realize that with more data, they could do things more precisely, um, their demands for data processing uh, grew further. So there was a lot of money going into uh, efforts to push forward computing technology with the idea that there would be defense applications beyond just code breaking. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was really the key driver of the, the desire to miniature, find a new technology to miniaturize computing power and shift from the vacuum tube to the, to the chip. Right. And you describe it in the book, but, I, uh, but I'm sure our audience would find it interesting too. And, and by the way, as I ask these questions, uh, I hope the, the audience that's out there listening, remember, please use the Q&A function on Zoom in order to pose questions, which we will then weave into our conversation. But who came up with the idea that it was possible to, to go from a tube, which was, because if it's all about creating switches that can turn on and off, right? It's, you know, everybody knows when a light bulb goes on and off. So how did we get to the point where it was possible to put those circuits onto a silicon chip? It was a two-step process to go from a, a vacuum tube to a, a chip. The first step was to invent something called the transistor, mm -hmm. uh, which was a, a different type of switch. And a transistor was uh, based on, at least the transistors that we use today, are based around the idea that you can take a, a type of material called a semiconductor. So it's not, mm -hmm. a, not a, an insulator like glass or a, a conductor like copper wire. It's a type of material such as silicon, which you can turn the conductivity on and off by applying an electric field to it. Uh, and the first transistor was uh, invented in the late 1940s at Bell Labs uh, by three uh, Americans who go on to win the uh, Nobel Prize for this invention. But transistors themselves were quite large at the time and then to be wired together if you wanted multiple transistors to be uh, in the same computing system. And so in the late 1950s, uh, separately in Texas at Texas Instruments and at 
a California startup called Fairchild Semiconductor, uh, two different groups of uh, engineers came up with the idea of putting multiple transistors on a single piece of silicon, which was vastly more reliable and made it possible to shrink these transistors so you could have multiple different electrical switches on a single silicon chip. To the point where, if I if I saw the number in your book, right, 11.8 billion, is that right, on a single chip? Well, that's right. And actually, the, the newest generation iPhone has now made that number uh, <laughs> um, far, far out of date. A, a newer iPhone will have 15 billion transistors on just one of the chips. And if you um, go to chips that might be in a data center, for example, some of the some of the most advanced chips can have around 50 billion transistors on a chip. Um, so it's if you think back to the ENIAC computer at the University of Pennsylvania that right. had tens of thousands of these little switches turning on and off, uh, and now a a new smartphone uh, will have um, you know a million times more computing power uh, in in much smaller area at much lower cost. It is it is fascinating to think about that right we carry around in our pocket more computing power than sent people to the moon, um, vastly which more. Vastly right more. vastly more, uh, just so that we can check on the score of the Phillies Braves game. But that, uh, anyway, just just to pick an example off the top of my head. But that, uh, but that that being said, you tell the story about the emergence of these American corporations, um, and then uh, the development of the chip spreads internationally. Um, and so uh, we can jump a little bit because I have Texas Instruments and Fairchild. That's very interesting. But where do where does Sony come into our discussion of the development of the silicon chip? Well, from the earliest days of the chip industry in the early 1960s. The, there was a focus on internationalization for a couple mm -hmm. of reasons. One is that there was always a realization that this was a product that could have global relevance. It wasn't just about selling to U.S. customers, important though that was, it was about selling globally. And some of the early uh, use cases like computers that would be used by corporations or um, consumer devices had obvious markets in Europe and Japan and elsewhere. The second thing was that uh, there was a desire to uh, reduce the cost. And in the early days, manufacturing chips was very labor intensive. You had lots mm -hmm. and lots of people who had to glue things together by hand, for example. Um, and so there was a desire to, to find uh, lower cost based production in Asia. And so there was a, a number of entry points for uh, companies in Asia, but especially at first in Japan to get involved in, in the chip industry. And the, the best example of this is Sony, uh, which uh, in the 1970s and 80s was really the, the most advanced consumer electronics firm in the world. And they, they were able to use the advances that semiconductors were providing to bring uh, new types of consumer goods to market uh, and to provide computing power uh, to, to new use cases. And their, their, their best example of uh, consumer innovation was the Sony Walkman, which at, at the time was a revolutionary device. Now we take it for granted that you can have music on demand um, like almost any song in the world. But at, at the time, that was um, something that was new and revolutionary. And they were able to do that um, because they were able to take advantage of the most advanced chip making technologies, couple them with a, um, a, a very efficient manufacturing process and sell them globally, not just in, in Japan, but sold more in, in the US and, and many in Europe uh, as well. And so it was an example of combining US technology with a great idea from Japan and a really efficient manufacturing process that crossed the Pacific. Um, and and reach global markets as a result. And of course, now uh, the spread then not just across the Pacific, but then within that Indo-Pacific uh, area now uh, to South Korea and especially to Taiwan, which plays a particularly important role in the story that you tell and gets us to a lot of geopolitical questions. So how does Taiwan become today the central location of the production of advanced semiconductors and silicon chips? Well, one of the um, one of the early figures who built up the chip industry at Texas Instruments in Texas was a uh, a scientist named Morris Chang, who was born in mainland China, um, studied at Harvard and MIT, and was hired by um, Texas Instruments uh, to lead their semiconductor division. And he was, in many ways, uh, almost personally responsible for building up uh, the chip industry in Texas, which is one of the central um, locations of chip production in, in the U.S. Um, but he was passed over for the role of CEO. In a, in a horrible error uh, by Texas <laughs> Instruments leadership uh, in the, in the mid-1980s. And so he was looking for another job, and he was really a, you know, a pillar of the industry. Uh, there was no one more influential than he was. And he was approached by the government of Taiwan, where he had some connections, uh, to start up a, a new company to help build the Taiwanese ship industry. And at the time, Chang was uh, thinking through a, a new business model for 
uh, chip firms, because up to this point, almost all companies both designed and produced manufactured chips in-house. But the process of both design and manufacturing was getting a lot more complicated. It was one mm -hmm. thing to design and manufacture a chip with 10,000 transistors, but we're at the cusp at this point of having um, having millions of transistors on a chip. And so it made sense for companies to specialize through one or the other. And so Chang had the idea of, of what about creating a company that only manufactured and could manufacture chips for lots of different designers, sort of like how Gutenberg had a printing press to print books by multiple authors. Um, he would do the same thing for computing for computer chips. And the Taiwanese government liked the idea and gave him basically a blank check uh, to build up a company. And he built a company called the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company that today is the world's most advanced chip maker and the largest producer of processor chips. And so when you think of a chip that's, for example, designed by Apple to go in a smartphone or designed by NVIDIA to go in a data center, these are chips that are designed by those companies, but they're manufactured uh, largely and in some cases exclusively by TSMC in Taiwan. And so today, 90% of the most advanced processor chips can only be made by one company on one small island in the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, that, that, which of course gets gets to some of these interesting geopolitical and practical questions. So I want to take a step back and think that one of the great one of the great aspects of your book is you talk about how the chip has become so essential to the modern world, and you make comparisons to other technologies or commodities, right? The oil, for example, right? And so I, I someday chip war will be on the shelf next to Daniel Ergen's Daniel Jurgen's book about oil when we're looking at these sort of central uh, uh, drivers of the world economy. But um, in some ways, right, you know, oil can be found not everywhere, but a lot of places. Um, theoretically, chips could be made anywhere, and yet they are all being made in one place. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, just a, I'm just a simple country historian, but that seems like a really terrible idea um, for, for something that the whole world needs. Um, how did that happen? I mean, outside of the, the, the brilliance of Morris Chang and the willingness of the, of the Taiwanese to make those kinds of, of, of investment supports, what kind of decisions went into people essentially saying, yeah, why not just have them all be made in one island that's right across the straits from, that's, that's, that's not even officially recognized by the international community as an independent country? Yeah, yeah. Well, there were a, a couple of, of decisions that led to that, and there were a lot of non-decisions that led to that. Mm -hmm. And I, think, I think the first context is the, the business context, which is that mm -hmm. over the past 30 years, there's been an incredible consolidation in the chip industry driven by economies of scale. So this is mm -hmm. just pure, pure commercial, pure economic factors. Uh, it's been the case that the more chips you produce, the more you can hone your chip making processes, make your manufacturing more efficient, and thereby provide better performance and lower cost. And so we've seen globally uh, consolidation, whereas today there are really only three companies that are anywhere close to the cutting edge uh, in, in chip making globally. Uh, mm -hmm. One is Intel in the US, one is Samsung in South Korea, and the third is Taiwan's TSMC. So that's been the economic backdrop and the technological backdrop for all of this. Second is that the, the Taiwanese government was a, a mix of smart and lucky to recruit Morris Chang to build TSMC in their island. I mean, TSMC could have stood for the Texas Semiconductor Manufacturing Company um, had there been uh, had there been a different set of circumstances in place. And in some ways, they, it's, they wouldn't it's even had to change the uh, the letterhead. Sorry, well, that's right. That's <laughs> right. It, it, it was a great error of, of of Texas Instruments for for not um, not right. giving Morris Chang that opportunity. And and in fact, he pitched that, this idea to the Texas Instruments board um, in the late 1970s before he was passed over to CEO and. And their business was doing well, and it sounded like a risky idea, and so no one wanted to, to, to gamble on it. Uh, whereas the Taiwanese didn't have an existing position in the chip industry, so they had to gamble to, to get any sort of position. So the, the Taiwanese government deserves a fair amount of credit. Mm -hmm. And then third, um, third of, of four factors. Third factor is that uh, the, building a chip facility is brutally expensive. A, an advanced chip making facility will cost $20 billion, making them the most expensive factories in human history uh, by one calculation. Uh, and so companies are very, very sensitive to differentials in cost. The, the main cost input to a chip making facility is machinery. And you buy the sh same machinery wherever you put it. Uh, and the second main input is, is tax policy. Mm. Uh, and so Taiwan uh, was more generous with uh, its tax incentives than the US was and than other countries were, which is why uh, it was uh, part of the reason why it was cheaper to build facilities in Taiwan and elsewhere. 
final factor is that uh, other firms, above all Intel, failed to keep up with TSMC technologically. Mm -hmm. um, and Intel, up until five years ago, was really the world's leader in terms of producing the most advanced processor chips. But it slipped behind. It's had a bunch of cultural issues internally that the new CEO is trying to sort out. But right now, they're behind. Um, and what that means uh, is that TSMC's had sort of an open field to gain new customers, to grow at scale further, to eke out yet more efficiencies. Uh, and that's why today there's uh, really no major competitor, there's a couple minor competitors, but no major competitor to TSMC in terms of the production of advanced processor chips. Right. And you you mentioned in your introductory remarks, and you mentioned, uh, it, you of course, discussed in the book, that uh, it's possible to copy chips. But, uh, and so in that sense, right, one wonders, you know, why aren't there just people making bootleg chips that are as good as the ones from TSMC? I think you've explained that a little bit, but you can go back to that. But when you mentioned this, the Soviet example of a, a society that for one reason or another was not able to, to build the kind of intellectual infrastructure to design chips. Um, I am, uh, I, I find it fascinating to think that uh, the, uh, you know, once somebody gets out in front on the design um, and the production, that it's hard to catch up. Um, that seems, in a in certain sense, it seems counterintuitive, right? There was a time in the 19th century when the British were the first to develop, say, the steel, the, the, the capacity to make steel, and it was just a matter of other countries figuring out the same process and then adapting it. So I understand factories are expensive, you need tax policy to do it, but um, why else haven't uh, why haven't say the, the the Chinese on the mainland or or in the United States or in any other part of the world? Um, is it why is it so difficult for for them? Is it just that for the moment at least it, you can keep buying them from Taiwan, so it just doesn't matter? Yeah, I think there are, there are two reasons. So mm -hmm. one, the first reason is Moore's law, mm -hmm. uh, and what Moore's law is was actually a prediction, not a law. It was first made in 1965 by Gordon Moore, who uh, Ron you mentioned, the one of the co-founders of Intel. In, in 1965, Moore noticed that the number of transistors on each chip had been doubling annually. So it started at four and then went to eight. Um, and, and he predicted it would go all the way through 1975, and there would be 65,000 transistors on a chip. Uh, and that, that was borne out. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, uh, that exponential growth rate has basically stayed the same. It's grown at an exponential rate with some variations, but we've got basically a doubling every uh, two years. Uh, in terms of the number of transistors per chip, which means a doubling of the computing power for each chip. And until recently, uh, that was also associated with the declining cost per transistor. So you get a free lunch of computing power every two years. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is that the chip industry has raced forward at a far faster speed than any other sector of the economy. I mean, imagine if airplanes flew twice as fast every two years, or houses were built twice as large every two years, or you got twice as many french fries with your mcdonald's i mean nothing else in society <laughs> doubles uh, right. at, at an annual rate um and so nothing else has been harder to catch up in than these industries that that's that's number yeah. one and, and i think we many people have heard of moore's law and know that it's associated with with the fact that we've got great computers but getting your head around exponential growth rates are is really hard you right. just don't see them in in normal life and most of the rest of the economy improves productivity at two or three percent a year Right. And the chip industry has been growing at, in, in a different universe uh, right. for over half a century. So that's, that's reason number one. Um, you're, if you're trying to catch up, you're trying to catch up to a train moving very, very rapidly. Um, and reason number two is that because it's so expensive and because it's so hard to do, the, the, the risk of trying seriously and failing is an enormous cost bill. <laughs> yeah, and so I can see that. If, if, if you're any other country, and you've got the option of going to TSMC in Taiwan and getting very high quality chips at competitive prices or betting tens of billions of dollars in something that's probably going to fail. It's not a very good bet to make. Hmm. And so everyone has chosen just to produce in Taiwan instead. And so just to be, uh, making something up off the top of my head. So therefore, if I really wanted to control the world chip industry, I should just look at trying to control the island of Taiwan. Well, certainly Taiwan uh, is irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. um, if yeah. go ahead, yeah. no, so please, please go from there. Well, yeah. So if if Taiwanese production were to be taken offline, or if there were a blockade that prevented the export of chips from Taiwan, it would be hard to make a, a smartphone anywhere in the world the next year. 
Um, we wouldn't build hardly a single new cell phone tower the next year. Uh, PC production would fall by a third. Data center build out would slow. Powers and dishwashers and microwaves would face mammoth delays. Around one third of the new computing power we add each year comes from chips made in Taiwan. So imagine the world uh, with a lot less computing power being added. Um, that gives you a, a, a sense of just how damaging it would be. I mean, one other data point would be over the past two years, we had a semiconductor shortage, which mm -hmm. uh, you've probably seen in the news, costing just to give you one example, the global auto industry had $200 billion of losses due to cars that couldn't be completed. Uh, the last two years, in both years, 2020 and 2021, the world produced far more chips than the prior year. So there was an 8% increase in the number of chips between 2019 and 2020, and then a double digit uh, rate of increase between 2020 and 2021. But demand surged forward even more, and so there was a shortage. Now imagine how bad the world would be if we saw a one-third decrease in the number of processor chips. I mean, that would just be catastrophic uh, to the extent that you know it wouldn't just be autos, it would be microwaves and dishwashers and everything else that we rely on facing horrible delays. Uh, and so that is a cost that would be measured in trillions. Um, and it's something that most people don't even realize they ought to be afraid of. They will after they hear this conversation, Chris. So that's uh, so good for us, I guess. Um, I do see a question came in from the audience. Rashi Gupta asks, uh, mentions that India is building its first chip factory. Um, what is India's role in the future? I mean, is it we, going back to this question whether it's worthwhile for countries to try to get into this business? Uh, you know, is it is it worthwhile? Um, and can India begin to play a role in this if they jump in now and huff and puff to catch up? Well, it's a, it's a tricky business for India to get involved in for the reasons we've spoken about. The, mm -hmm. the investment involved is large. There's a lot of specialized knowledge in Taiwan, in South Korea, in the U.S., existing centers of production, which can be learned, but uh, it takes time to, uh, to get people with the right unique skill sets. Right. Um, and so I think uh, from my perspective, there's more space for India, less in the manufacture of chips and other parts of the chip supply chain, because we can get into this run if you'd like to, but mm -hmm. making an advanced chip requires 2,000 different process steps or more in some cases. Um, and India already plays a big role in the design of chips. There are more chip designers in India uh, than any, any country in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's plenty of space. And, and chip design is largely, a, it's, it's akin to software engineering. You, you design a chip in a, in a type of software. Um, and so there's a lot of space, I think, for India to take its existing skills in, in that field. Uh, and develop them more fully. And it's a lot less capital intensive than building a massively expensive chip facility. Right. Um, before I go to a longer question, so maybe something with a short answer, we, we you, you mentioned the idea of uh, of these facilities being difficult to build, very expensive. And I think of the facility, if, if I wanted to imagine, you know, if I don't travel to Taiwan, but I want to imagine what the facilities look like. I mean, how many factories are we talking about? Are we talking about, am I imagining just one or two gigantic buildings or is it the kind of thing that can be done in multiple facilities? Well, there, there, are, there are a, for the most of facilities, there's actually a pretty small number. Um, yeah. Again, because economies of scale are, are, are quite substantial. So TSMC has less than two dozen facilities um, mm -hmm. in its entire global footprint. Most of them are in Taiwan. Um, and yes, we're talking about massive buildings that have um, huge output. So, so there's a, a small number of facilities that are producing the most advanced ships. If you look at less advanced ships, you'll find a larger number of those facilities, some of them older, others built more recently, but they, they cost less to make uh, less advanced ships. But overall, the number worldwide is not that large. And many countries have zero semiconductor production. They're entirely reliant on uh, imports from abroad. Right. And uh, we're talking about sand here, right? <laughs> Which, yep. of course, of course, I would also argue if we if we had a discussion about fracking, we would say that that sand is also a big part of that, too, and that this sand is becoming one of the most important traded mined commodities on the planet right now, something that I don't think a lot of folks would have thought about before this conversation. Well, that's right. Silicon is, uh, I believe it's the case that silicon is the, the most um, widespread uh, mineral in the Earth's crust. Mm -hmm. um, but the challenge is not simply to find silicon, but to purify it right. uh, to an extraordinary degree, and then to you're basically manipulating individual atoms uh, yes. when you're actually carving chips. So each each transistor um, on a, a chip in your iPhone, for example, will be smaller than a coronavirus, and your phone needs uh, billions of them to function. 
smaller than the coronavirus. I mean, this, uh, that, that, uh, that, that's a, a thought too. And, and of course it raises, it, it becomes, you know, Arthur Clarke has that famous line that technology that is sufficiently beyond the understanding of the observer is indistinguishable from magic. Um, and so if we're talking about we're talking about millions or billions of transistors on something that is you know smaller than the naked eye. Um, we we are into that realm of you know we know that it's real because we can check that Philly score on our phone, but it is virtually indistinguishable from magic. Don't expect me to explain how it happens. We actually Mike Mike Shearer writes in a comment who says that uh, that he uh, that he's been in the semi industry since 1978 and he. Yes, a uh, relatively complicated question, but I want to see if I can boil it down. And this is the relationship that the United States is trying to keep advanced tools from going to the People's Republic of China. But what do you think is the balance between the device makers and the tool makers? So the, the designers of the iPhones, but the designers of the tools that are creating the chips that make the iPhones. If I, if I understand Mike's question properly, yep. let me know, Mike, if I got that right. Go ahead. Well, maybe to, to answer that, to, just for listeners who, who don't know the, the details like Mike does, just to describe a bit the chip making process uh, sure. very briefly. So you, you, you design a chip in, um, in very unique software for chip design, and there are basically three companies that make this chip design software. Then you email that file, uh, more or less, to the manufacturing facility. And the manufacturing facility needs to buy a lot of really specialized chemicals and ultra-pure silicon um, for their facility to actually make the chips. And then there are machines that do the the carving and the deposition of very thin films on the silicon to actually carve the circuits into the silicon. And these machines are among the most precise machines ever invented in human history. Um, they can cost, the most expensive of them uh, in the lithography space cost $150 million a piece. So it's the most expensive machine tool uh, in human history. Um, and they're so expensive because they're, they're actually doing the work of etching tiny shapes uh, in the silicon that are smaller than a coronavirus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why they, they require such precision. And, and the machine tool market is really dominated by a small number of firms that have been in their position in the market for, um, in, in most cases, uh, a fair amount of time, in most cases, uh, several decades. Uh, and some of these firms are, are, are based in California. Uh, applied Materials, as Mike mentioned, KLA, LAM Research, um, and so, yes, the, the U.S. Is, is very committed to preventing um, a lot of the most advanced machine tools from being transferred to China. Um, the rest of the machine tools that you need to make an advanced chip are built either in Japan or in the Netherlands. So there's three companies <laughs> that control the machine tools um, to something close to 100 percent of the machine tools that you need to build an advanced chip. Um, and this is a crucial point of leverage. Uh, and so TSMC, the Taiwanese firm or Samsung or Intel, any chip maker can only make chips by buying equipment from these firms. And so it is increasingly an area of focus for the U.S., making sure there's a clear controls as to who gets access to which machine tools. I wouldn't say that that um, gives the U.S. an extraordinary advantage because uh, it's still the case that TSMC is better than any company in the world at using these machine tools to make advanced chips. So there's sort of a, 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 a symbiotic relationship. The U.S. provides the tools, also a lot of the chip designs, the Taiwanese use them and 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 are able to make the best ships as a result mm -hmm. um but yes there's there's certainly points of leverage that the u.s has because a lot of the tools are only made in the u.s and that also would be uh, put a potential limit on what the uh what the people's republic of china is able to do if they're not able to get access to that technology either right. either, either directly or years. indirectly yeah for the past yeah, five years about five years there's been a steady tightening of the the rules over which equipment China can get. And as of last week, uh, when those rules were tightened further, uh, now uh, you, you can't transfer tools to China that are used in the most recent um, five or in cases, 10 generations of, of chip making. So the goal is to keep China really quite far behind hmm. where we are today. And obviously the Chinese are not taking this lying down. Are they developing their own uh, machine tool industry or trying to? Well, they're certainly trying to. Um, mm -hmm. The challenge is that it's very hard <laughs> yeah. because you need to um, you need to uh, have tools that not only can manipulate tiny um, shapes the way we discussed, but do so a billion times on a single chip with basically perfect accuracy. Because if you have mm -hmm. too many errors, the chip is useless, you've got to throw it away, and so you can't make a business around that. Um, and the combination of precision plus uh, repetition is just very, very, very hard to do, which is why only a small number of firms have been able to do it. <laughs> 
this is uh, which which gets us back. You mentioned the supply chain problems of the last few years, which of course really highlighted the fact that if all the chips are coming from one place and speaking of the coronavirus, if the coronavirus gets into a group of people and then they are not able to work and not able to make uh, uh, chips, then they don't get delivered around. And so as a result, there's been a lot of discussion about the possibility of uh, simplifying supply chains and onshoring. Um, and this, of course, is part of this the CHIP Act passed by the United States government. And so how do you see the CHIP Act, which was passed by bipartisan majorities in Congress and signed by President Biden. Um, how do you see the, the kinds of things that the United States is trying to do to revitalize, the, the, to use one of the terms they use, revitalize the American chip industry? What, what is likely to come of that? And what should one expect to be able to do by trying to onshore uh, these kinds of technologies? So my view is that a lot of the, the supply chain discussion that we've had over the past years has, has actually misdiagnosed the problem. Mm -hmm. um, many people have drawn links between the fact that supply chains are long and international and the fact that there have been delays, but that's actually not really the case. There's no evidence that uh, manufacturing facilities that are closer have, have fewer delays. Uh, and indeed, I think you know, I mentioned that the number of chips produced globally increased both in 2020 and 2021. Uh, in my view, the chip industry did an extraordinary job in doing everything it could to meet the surge in demand that led to uh, the shortage. Um, mm. you know, no one predicted that there would just be demand that would exceed double digit uh, growth levels. And so um, I, I think that although it's it's common in the media to, to, to explain the shortage due to complicated international supply chains, I think it's actually the opposite. It's mm. because we've got complicated international supply chains that we're able to get the efficiencies that have made computing power cheap and ubiquitous. And had we had less manufacturing in Taiwan and more in the US, I see no evidence that would work better. Um, and I think it could quite possibly would have worked worse. Um, I, I think the supply chain risk that I worry about is, is there's just one, and, and that's that tensions between China and Taiwan accelerate in a way that uh, calls into question the world's access to Taiwan semiconductor production capabilities. Um, you know, nothing that happened last year is remotely relevant in terms of scale <laughs> relative uh, to what uh, the world economy would suffer in case China somehow cut off Taiwanese chip exports. Right. And that, I think, is where we ought to focus all of our discussion about supply chains, is that hmm. uh, singular risk uh, without which we couldn't produce a single smartphone, for example, uh, the next year. And I think to the, to the credit of, of Congress and the Biden administration, I think that the CHIPS funding has actually been fairly focused on that issue, on um, incentivizing more production of the most advanced chips in the U.S. And also to its credit, uh, the, the legislation doesn't um, only uh, offer funds to U.S. companies. It offers funds to Korean companies or, or Taiwanese companies if they build in the U.S. as well. Um, and I, I think that uh, preserves some of the competition uh, that we mm. want because there's a risk of um, getting involved in subsidizing domestic businesses and ending up not having a competitive market. And what we want is for all three of the companies that are capable of producing uh, chips that are leading edge or close to the leading edge to be producing in the U.S., competing with each other, giving us the supply we need in case of an emergency in Taiwan, um, but not bringing us to a situation where we're reliant on a single company uh, to produce the chips that we need, whether in Taiwan or in the U.S. So in other words, right, you're, you're, you're saying that we can, we can encourage, there, there is existing advanced chip production in the United States, which can be encouraged, but we should not imagine that this it, production in the United States is going to replace of uh, saying they have the supply from Taiwan simply simply by virtue of the amount of chips that come from Taiwan? That's right. I, I mm -hmm. think the, the cost of replacing uh, production in Taiwan would just be enormously large. And we're, we're already spending around $40 billion as a country mm -hmm. over the next mm -hmm. five years to incentivize more advanced to banking in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, the Europeans are doing something similar in Europe. Japan has been trying to uh, incentivize more chip making there too. So we're going to get some diversification of uh, production away from Taiwan, which is a good thing for security's sake. Uh, but to completely uh, replace shipping in Taiwan would cost uh, many times what we currently spent. And there's just no appetite for that level of spending, despite the fact that actually the risk is is, is not insignificant. Right. Well, two two questions spring from what you just described. I mean, one is I I, I don't know when when whenever we talk about in the United States, when we talk about industrial policy, right, hidden in the background is the idea that if only we could bring 
manufacturing of whatever kind back to the United States, that it will produce substantial new jobs. And so um, it's one thing to talk about how important chips are, which they certainly are. Um, but does, you know, is the production of silicon chips, is the production of even advanced chips or even run of the mill chips for my dishwasher, are they, um, is this a substantial source of, of jobs? And should we view it that way? You know, I, I think that's probably the wrong framing. There, All right, there, are, good. there are jobs uh, at stake, but mm -hmm. chip making facilities are pretty automated. That's what uh, I was, that's what I was thinking about, right? Different machinery involved. Now, obviously, it's not just the facility itself. There's all the suppliers that go into the facilities. Um, right. The $40 billion we're spending on advanced chip making is not a cost-effective job creation scheme. Yeah. It's a cost-effective yeah. worst-case insurance policy in case China attacks Taiwan. Uh, and right. I think that's the only only way we can we can really justify the bill. Um, there, there is, I think, concern that as more manufacturing of chips has moved offshore, certain skill sets in the U.S. have become harder to find. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. one of the benefits of the Chips Act funding will be that we're going to have more people with the unique skill sets in chip making. But I think uh, in terms of the, the price tag associated with the Chips Act, um, we should think of it in terms of insurance vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, Taiwan risk, first and foremost. Yeah. So rather than it's not, this is not a, this is not a jobs act. This is not something that's going to, you know, as important as chips are, right. Chips are not going to uh, employ as many people as steel or automobiles have employed right. people in previous eras. That's right. yeah. Well, and um, I see Rashi Gupta, Rashi Gupta asked a question that's, that I was hoping to get to. And that is, you know, what, do, what role does the one China policy play in this? And you mentioned, right. The idea that we want insurance against the possibility that the mainland would try to, uh, to hold on to or cut off Taiwan from the rest of the world. Um, but what would it be? What would happen if if Taiwan and China were to peacefully unify? Um, would that mean essentially that the People's Republic of China would control the world's supply of chips? Well, I, I, I worry. I think that the peaceful unification is 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 not very likely, given what we know about Taiwanese society. I think there's a, a much more worrisome scenario of coerced unification, yeah. um, whereby yeah. over time the military balance keeps shifting in China's favor. U.S. Uh, you know, vague U.S. security guarantees, the type that exist right now, become less and less credible. Um, China begins uh, or continues really to salami slice away uh, Taiwan's autonomy. And at some point, the Taiwanese feel like the U.S. isn't there. They've got no chance of standing up to the Chinese in any sort of real fight, and they've got to right. start giving in to China's demands. And I think what's worth noting right now is that today Taiwan um, adheres, uh, you know, almost perfectly to U.S. restrictions in terms of what they can and cannot sell to China. When the U.S. Right. Uh, rolls out a new uh, restriction in terms of uh, Chinese chip firms preventing the transfer of technology to them, the Taiwanese enforce that. Um, that's not guaranteed. That could, uh, in the future, uh, potentially change. And there's no doubt that the Chinese, uh, as their power increases, will certainly pressure the Taiwanese to move in that direction. And so I do worry that uh, one potential future, which is not guaranteed, but is possible, is that uh, the Chinese are able to ramp up pressure on Taiwan and to demonstrate that we're unable to help Taiwan at an acceptable cost. Mm -hmm. And that the Taiwanese realize that they've basically got no choice but to, or at least conclude they have no choice but to give in to Chinese demands. And in that case, um, it's not inconceivable that Chinese regulations and Chinese demands could start shaping Taiwan's chip policy as well. And, and that would be a very uncomfortable place for us to find ourselves in. Uh, for sure. Because uh, we'd still be reliant at that point, uh, most, most likely, on chips made in Taiwan. Right. And and because that I think is so that the danger is not right. I, it's hard to imagine that the Chinese would uh, uh, would want to to start a shooting war over Taiwan in a way that would endanger the production of chip technology. Right. One, one could imagine the idea of, of creating increasing pressure and sort of gradually pulling Taiwan away, which, of course, then raises the question of what should American policy be um, on Taiwan and on the on this sort of triangular relationship, uh, because clearly, if the United States is going to play the uh, is going to essentially play this game where we are trying to keep this technology away from the Chinese as much as possible, so the Chinese have to just but they can buy things from Taiwan, but they can't buy any of the things that make the things. Um, if if 
you know, we, that, that can't last forever, um, or may, perhaps one could try, but uh, it opens the possibility that when the Chinese have the upper hand, then they could just do the same thing to us. Um, but what should American policy be with regard to Taiwan? How, what kind of guarantees should we be giving the Taiwanese in order to make sure that we don't reach this day where we wake up one day and the Taiwanese say, ah, we're going to make a deal with Beijing? I think there are, are, are two things that we've done badly at the last, last decade or maybe even longer. Oh, only two? One is, Sorry. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> with regard to this issue. Um, <laughs> one is in terms of our, our signaling mm -hmm. about our willingness to defend Taiwan, um, which we've been vague on, partially because our policy has been to be vague. Yes. Um, but I think that policy has, um, to some degree, outlived its usefulness. And, and in mm -hmm. fact, Biden has sort of been walking back that policy, saying he's actually going to defend Taiwan and then his aides deny it. And so it's a little bit less vague, but still pretty vague. Um, but the reason the vagueness is, is, is less compelling today than it was a decade ago is because it's just less believable because right. the military balance has shifted so much. And if you think back to the 1995, 96 uh, Taiwan Straits crisis, when China was shooting missiles over Taiwan's airspace, Bill Clinton, who was president at the time, sent an aircraft carrier battle group through the Taiwan Straits. You know, I, I don't think Joe Biden would do that today, uh, because the, that aircraft carrier battle group would be at a huge risk of um, of all of the Chinese anti-ship missiles that now ring the Taiwan Straits. And it's no secret that the U.S. Mm -hmm. Navy would face a much harder time operating, not only in the Taiwan Straits, but in the entire, um, within the entire um, that coastal area of China, that the Air Force would have a much more complicated operating environment, and that as a result, we'd face a much more serious fight if we were asked to help defend Taiwan. Um, and because everyone knows that, it's patently obvious, uh, we've had to lean more on the credibility of our guarantees, and it's hard to make credible guarantees when A, your military situation is worsening by the day, and B, right. your policy is to be vague. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about this, right? Is, is how am I supposed to issue a, uh, somehow I'm, uh, I, I'm president of the United States, you know, God forbid, uh, I'm president of the United States and I have to, I have to somehow issue a guarantee that will be completely, uh, completely believable and credible to the Taiwanese, but will not upset Beijing. Uh, that can't be done, right? I mean, yeah, the, the, and, and so this means that this, this kind of balancing act has to continue. Um, which one wonders in American politics, and this this relates to a question that that I wanted to also get at you as in your in your previous hat as a uh, as a Russianist, uh, which I know that a hat that you still wear. I guess it's sort of a fuzzy black hat that you wear, especially on cold days. But the um, that there are people, I people here, colleagues that I know of, and students here at the War College, people I've met other places who say that American policy on Ukraine is misguided because we are we're essentially pursuing a conflict with Russia at the same time we should be preparing for the real conflict that matters, and that is with China. Now, a superpower should be able to walk and chew gum at the same time, but how should the United States imagine dealing with the, this, this real and significant long-term challenge of China while also dealing with this real and significant immediate term challenge from Russia to the existing order. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act, which is an unsatisfactory mm -hmm. answer. I, I think those people who say that we'd be better off abandoning the Ukrainians and devoting all of our resources to Taiwan, I think misunderstand the extent to which abandoning Ukraine would reverberate across the rest of the world, right. uh, sending exactly the wrong signal to uh, to China and to the rest of the region as to America's willingness to um, to stand by its friends and to um, to 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 stand up to efforts to to change international status quo. Um, but I think people who say that are right to diagnose the fact that even today, um, as you know, war is being waged in Europe, uh, we're still not being serious. I don't think about the the resources that our commitments require. Mm -hmm. um, and I I look at the evidence that uh, you know the, the the stockpile of javelin missiles that we've expended uh, giving to Ukraine will take several years to be rebuilt, according to uh, news reports, as evidence that we're not really serious about what it would take to mm. defend Taiwan. Um, the fact that our stockpiles are that low to begin with, and the fact that our defense industrial base is so slow to produce missiles, are both very worrisome to me. Um, and I don't think there's enough uh, enough enough recognition of the fact that. Um, 
if China is going to act, it won't necessarily wait for our missile production rates to, <laughs> to hit high speed. Um, <laughs> right. This is this is the Russians won't you know willing to wait for us before they launch their attack on Ukraine. So I, I think we are not we're not taking the Taiwan issue seriously enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think that means we ought to throw the Ukrainians under the bus or pretend that our decisions in Ukraine won't reverberate across the world, including in the Taiwan Straits. And of course, uh, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, uh, Javelin missiles require probably any number of silicon uh, computer chips in order to function well, properly, right? There are there are over 200 semiconductors in a Javelin missile, and and Javelins are are not even sophisticated weapons. Uh, they were designed <laughs> right. decades ago. I mean, and actually, part of the problem with uh, building up the, jav the Javelin stockpile is that some of my electronics is so old uh, that it's had to have been redesigned. But certainly when you think of the next generation weapon systems, yes, they're, they are full of advanced processor chips, memory chips, signal processing, which is why this is, you know, the chip war is not just a sort of metaphor. It's, mm -hmm. it's partly about military technology. And the, I, I, I'm trying to imagine, right, somebody listening to this conversation and, uh, and I, either they come away terrified, recognizing that uh, it sounds like right time is on China's side and the United States is desperately doing whatever it can to hold on to what advantages it currently enjoys. Um, does the, uh, what would you say to the audience that says, well, golly, Dr. Miller, it sounds like we can't really stop the Chinese. We're just trying to slow them down. Um, a, are there alternative policies we should be pursuing? Or B, do you think that, say, the uh, determined sort of application of good sense and good budgeting would allow us to continue to hold on to our advantages. I mean, which which is the best way to go? Well, I think our advantages are are substantial, and and I think one of the the striking things that I've learned over the course of this research is the ways in which our our discussions about challenges we face often morph into uh, misdiag wrongful diagnoses of places we lag behind. So you know, I spent, like everyone else, the last uh, five or 10 years reading stories about Chinese tech firms taking over the world. Yes. Um, and the more you dig in, the more you realize that, A, Chinese tech firms have grown because Google and Facebook have been banned from China. Um, B, Chinese tech firms are big because China's big. And in fact, they've expanded in many cases nowhere else in the world. And C, you know, Alibaba and Tencent and the whole rest of the Chinese tech ecosystem only functions on uh, semiconductors that are made in the U.S. and Taiwan and South Korea. So I, I think we we need to be realistic about the challenges we face, but also the cards that we have. Um, and what I really worry about is that the Chinese Chinese read our debates uh, and sense more weakness than there actually is, and therefore feel emboldened. Of course, that was the error. That Putin made. Uh, uh, Putin um, thought Ukraine was far weaker than it was, thought that the West was far less likely to support Ukraine than in fact the West has been, and therefore sensed weakness when he ought to have sen uh, sensed um, comparative strength. And I, and I worry that the Chinese might have the same misreading. And if you you know open the New York Times any day of the week, I can understand why you would misread in that way, because there are obviously lots of problems, and there are you know it's an easy story to tell. Uh, the U.S. is sort of the Roman Empire uh, uh, in, in its final stages of decline. Uh, in fact, I'm not so sure that's the case. Well, and and in one of the, I mean, this is an argument that goes back to, uh, but back to the latter years of the Cold War, that the the danger for a free society is we are carrying out our own political debates and our own discussions in open view. And so people know when we're fighting with each other. People know when we have an election coming up and certain folks have an interest in talking down the abilities of the folks in charge because they want to be the folks in charge. And, and there we, we have plenty of examples of times where people felt that democracies were at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis autocracies because autocracies somehow are, are more efficient and better organized. Of course, over and over again, we've seen that autocracies are a little brittle and not all that efficient. Um, it's a real problem when the boss doesn't have anybody around him who says, hey, man, I don't know that we need to invade Ukraine right now. Um, and so I like this, uh, if, if I can nudge you a little more in this hopeful direction, right, the idea that we can discuss the challenges that face us, but we don't need to be afraid of the challenges that face us. And, uh, and how, so what's your what's your message going forward? And and what's next for you? What, what book are you going to start now that in five years is going to be an incredibly timely bestseller? <laughs> well, to be honest, I don't know a good answer to that question yet. That's, that's, <laughs> that requires some, some some new reading first, I think, that I haven't Probably. had a chance to to dig into yet, sadly. Um, but no, I think you're I think you're right about not underestimating U.S. strengths, and I, I think a key part of that that I've 
come to appreciate more is the way the U.S. alliance system dramatically enhances U.S. power. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think you see that not only in the military alliances that we're used to studying, but also when it comes to um, supply chains and, and economic alliances. So for example, um, you know, it's not a coincidence that if you want to make an advanced semiconductor, you can only do so using equipment produced in, a US, in the U.S. or in a U.S. ally. Um, that that, that emerged in part because these countries are the most advanced uh, economies, but also because uh, U.S. policy and policy in other countries was happy to rely on allies and unwilling to rely in many cases on adversaries. Um, and that's been a source of immense strength because it means that since the days of the Cold War, U.S. firms and firms from Japan and firms from Europe have been able to uh, source components and sell to uh, a market that includes all of the world's uh, biggest uh, economies. Uh, whereas today, Chinese firms are in a very different position. They've got a big economy at home, uh, the second biggest economy in the world, but they're increasingly facing pressure when they look uh, outside of China. Uh, whereas for U.S. firms, they can still easily sell in Japan or Korea or Taiwan or, or Europe, which remain many of the world's biggest economies. So that's a, a real source of power uh, that I think is often underplayed. And when we think about alliances, we don't think about economic uh, economic alliances because there's no sort of formal treaty structure the way there is for NATO, but in fact, they've been immensely influential in shaping how the tech industry, for example, is structured. Sure. I, I, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up, right? It's, it's so often in American politics, people talk about al allies are just a, a problem, right? They're not spending enough on defense. They're not doing this. They're not doing that. When um, our adversaries or our, our, our global competitors do not have allies, Right. They have clients. They have uh, they have uh, uh, dependencies. Um, but uh, um, one last question, and then we'll uh, and that is um, uh, the idea of is this an east west development? What about the rest of Asia in dealing with with the chip war? Right? Can is this a way? When we think about a future, Parakana says, right, the future is Asian, right? We talk about the need for understanding these dynamics in Asia. Um, is it possible that Eastern, uh, that that's, it's, uh, businesses and nations in Asia that are getting into this business will be able to uh, play a stronger international role because of their place in the ch chip war? Well, I, I, I'm skeptical that that's the right framing. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly not how the industry is structured today. The, the right. chip industry has always been trans-Pacific from the yeah. early 1960s, it's been trans-Pacific, um, but it's been an industry that's been uh, built on both shores of the Pacific Ocean, whether mm -hmm. that's in California and the US side or uh, in Japan and Taiwan and Korea and parts of Southeast Asia in, in Asia. So there's nothing new to this setup. It's it's the oldest thing uh, that and it's from the earliest days of the chip industry, it's been this way. Um, and so I don't think there's anything uniquely Asian about the industry since it's been there been this way from the beginning. Um, I think that we that the change we've seen is not uh, um, as much about Taiwan or Korea or Japan. It's about China. Um, mm -hmm. China's been the country that's been uh, pouring the most government uh, subsidy funds into its industry over the past couple of years. China's a country that's trying to uh, win for itself a a much larger role in the supply chain and a role that gives China more political influence as well as economic influence. And that's really the key change right now. And in response to that change, what you see is all of the existing players, whether it's Taiwan or Korea or the US, to different degrees, but all of them lining up and saying that they're happy with the status quo. They don't want to see China play a much bigger role. And they're all taking um, steps, again, to different degrees, but all, all, all basically moving in the same direction to reduce investment in China, to limit technology to transfer to China, and to defend the status quo of an industry that's worked immensely well for the entire world. Well, I, I, I will, we'll have to end it there, unfortunately. It's been a great conversation about a very interesting book. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks to Chris Miller. Uh, thanks, Chris. It's always fun to see you. One of these days, I'll actually be in the same room with you, I hope, someday before too long. Um, Chip War is available in bookstores now, so please uh, grab, your, grab your copies. Uh, Thanks again, Chris. FPRI would like to thank our sponsors, our partners, our members for their generous support, and all of you for joining us. Please consider becoming a member or partner or sponsor of FPRI to continue to help to support this work, because today's conversation is just the beginning. The world goes on, and we will be here to discuss it at FPRI. If you've enjoyed our discussion today, please 
tell a friend and bring a friend next time as we gather to analyze our complex world. To keep up with future episodes of People, Politics, and Prose and other events at FPRI, visit our website, fpri.org, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. You can follow the host of this program on Twitter, at Ronald Granary. It's been a delight talking to you all today. Until next time, for all of us at FPRI, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us.